All right. Well, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're pleased to bring you the latest uh, webinar in our series um, focusing on artificial intelligence and data analytics for human development. My name is Jana Aranda, and I'm the president of Engineering for Change, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. The webinar you're participating in today will be archived on our webinars page and our YouTube channel. Both URLs for those channels are listed on the slide. Information on upcoming webinars is available on our webinars page. Um, E4C members will receive invitations to upcoming webinars directly. If you have any questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics and speakers, please contact the E4C webinar series team at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. If you're following us on Twitter today, please join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. Before we move on to our presenters, I'd like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change. E4C is a knowledge organization, digital platform, and global community of over 1 million people, including engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. Some of those challenges may include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy solutions, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member. E4C membership is free and provides access to news and thought leaders, such as the ones you're going to hear from today, insights on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding calls, fellowships, and more. E4C members also enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with the site, the better we'll be able to serve your resources aligned to your interests. We invite you to visit our website to learn more and sign up. If you're interested in learning more about data collection and other ICT or information and communication technology tools, we invite you to explore the E4C Solutions Library after the webinar. An example of the type of tech you'll find is the Simpris Vero Scanner and Platform, which combines a wireless biometric scanner, a mobile app, and the cloud to enroll and match people to their digital records with the touch of a finger. There, you can learn more about technical performance, compliance with standards, academic research, and user provision models of these kinds of systems. All the information is sourced by E4C's research fellows and reviewed by our community of experts. And it's all available to E4C members free of charge. So, a few housekeeping items before we get started. I see some chats already, so this is great. Um, let's practice using WebEx by telling us where you are in the world. So in the chat window, which is located to the bottom right of your screen, please type in your location. If the chat window is not open on your screen, try clicking the chat icon at the bottom of the screen, which is in the middle of the slide. It looks like a little talking button. So I'm going to go ahead and write my location and we'll see if everybody else is able to see it as well. So we have folks from London, from New York, myself, <laughs> from Montreal, from Iowa, uh, let's see, Panama, Chile, uh, Damam, Saudi Arabia, Hamburg, Germany, London, lots of folks joining us from Pakistan and more. Great. Please do use the chat window to uh, go ahead and continue these conversations. You can also share remarks, um, share resources. If you have a technical question, you can also feel free to send a private chat to the Engineering for Change admin. All right. During the webinar, we encourage you to use the Q&A window located below the chat to type in your questions for the presenters. Again, if you don't see it, please click the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slides. So I see some folks did answer this question also in, um, in the Q&A window. I see folks from Egypt and other locations. Uh, yeah, to just try to keep those kinds of comments in the chat window. And Q&A is specifically for Q&A so that we go ahead and, and we keep track of those questions uh, for our presenters. If you are listening to the audio podcast um, and encounter any trouble 
Try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try up opening WebEx in a different browser. E4C webinars qualify professional engineers for one professional development hour. To request your PDH, please sign in and go to your member dashboard to access the PDH form. The URL is also listed on the slide. All right, thank you again for joining us. We have lots of folks here from all over the world today, from Kenya to India, Colombia to Tennessee to Princeton, New Jersey. Welcome everyone, we're so thrilled to have you with us today. Obviously lots of interest in this particular topic. So our first speaker today is Shashi Bulaswar, who is the CEO of the Institute for Transformative Technologies and the founder of the Light Institute at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. He is the lead author of the recently released groundbreaking study to identify the 50 most critical scientific and technological breakthroughs required for sustainable global development. We are thrilled and honored to have Shashi join us. And I'm going to go ahead, Shashi, and pass control of the slides to you so you can advance them. And let's, uh, let's jump into it. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Uh, thanks for joining this. Um, what we'll do is talk about AI in the context specifically of the Sustainable Development Goals coming up in 2030. Now, nowadays, we live in an all AI, all the time world. And the conversations tend to range from AI saving the planet and humanity all the way to destroying everything, right? And, and the problem is, um, obviously, they can't all coexist, all, all these scenarios. The problem for us uh, really is that the conversations tend to be in, in huge generalities. And it's very important um, as organizations working in the social change, social justice, um, human development space make decisions about uh, where to invest their money and their energy, it's very important to be much, much more specific about where AI can help. Um, and, uh, and specifically, if you're talk, talking about the Sustainable Development Goals, there are a lot of organizations that are gearing their strategies, uh, whether it's funding, whether it's implementation, whether it's policy towards that. And, and so it's, it's extremely important to unpack, first of all, what we mean by AI, and then specifically look at the, the topics in the Sustainable Development Goals, and understand where AI is relevant, uh, where, it's, uh, where it's essential, where it's uh, nice to have, and in some cases, uh, where it's a distraction. And um, what we'll do is start a little bit with understanding AI. The most important thing to understand about AI is it evolves continuously. You know, what was AI, what was considered AI in the 80s and 90s is today just considered commonplace analytics. So if you think about you know, financial services going back to the you know, 80s, 90s, you know, obviously there was data collected about um, uh, individuals and customers, you know, whether it was age, whether it was income, and so on and so forth. And financial services companies like banks um, made decisions on the basis of that. Is, is this individual credit worthy? Should we do business with them? How much interest should we charge them? And so on and so forth. Now, um, as uh, the world was able to collect more data about individuals, um, and as computers started becoming more powerful, what we saw is that the, the algorithms to analyze and use that data also became more sophisticated. So if you go to the right-hand side of, of, of the slide, what you see is the early days of uh, neural networks. You know, and without geeking out too much about, about neural networks themselves, what you see is you know, if you compare the left versus the right, you start seeing that, that uh, layer of bubbles in the middle. You know, in, in, the, in the parlance of neural networks, it's called a hidden layer. And what it allows you to do is, even as you collect lots of data, if you're not able to, to find a really good fit for the, for, the, for the analysis you're trying to do, you can try and cast it into an alternative dimension, alternative sets of dimensions. And, and what that allowed was, uh, you know, really black box uh, kind of curve fitting and analysis. So you're able to start um, um, analyzing things that were not remotely possible in the previous generation. Now, uh, the only constraints on how much you could analyze, and again, going back to the 90s, if you think about what computing looked like those days, you know, um, even the most sophisticated labs had large desktop uh, uh, computers. And, and you know, the idea of 
a tiny phone in your hand having a ridiculous amount of memory and, and uh, processing capacity was unimaginable. Um, fast forward to, to, to today. Uh, what you see is that, uh, you know, obviously there's data about us being all, all sorts of actions about uh, that, that we do. Uh, data is collected about that, where we are, what we buy, what we wear, and so on and so forth. Um, and at the same time, uh, computing obviously has also become enormously more powerful. And so what you see is, uh, again, just going back to a little bit of the neural network parlance, instead of just one um, one uh, level of depth in that hidden layer, you can have as many as you want. You can have millions and millions of data points. You have incredible computing. And therefore, you can have hyper-customization of things like services. Now, you can see, you, you know, if, if you shop on Amazon or something of that sort, you can see that level of customization starting to be used. Um, on one hand, when it comes to conveniences like you know, hyper-customization, like, like shopping exactly what you want, uh, where you want, when you want it, and so on and so forth, those conveniences are today made possible because of this. But the, the underlying question for, for those of us focused on human development is, well, is this really relevant? And so in that context, the first question to ask is, remember what I said earlier was, the constraint ultimately is the amount of data available and the type of computing available. Now, with respect to data, it is obviously wonderful that the mobile phone, the smartphone revolution has been taking place in low-income countries. But if you compare that to the kind of data infrastructure there is in industrialized countries, what you uh, obviously notice is that you know it's 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 while it's nice to have um, you know m mobile phone data, it doesn't come close to comparing to the to the data platforms, the data infrastructure that that you have in wealthier countries. Um, and in emerging economies like in India, you know, with 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 uh, systems like like the Aadhaar, now you're starting to see more and more of a, a data infrastructure. So what we've done is uh, introduce this idea of the data density index. The point there being that the more data there is about um, about individuals, about communities, systems, uh, countries, you know, the more useful things, and honestly, the more uh, non-useful things you can do with it. But you do need a certain threshold of data before you can start doing any real real analysis on it. And uh, what, we, what you see there is a, a smattering of countries along that uh, data density index. And to the left end of the, the spectrum are countries that we consider, according to this index, uh, data deficient, meaning that you know, there, there is some data starting to be collected, but really you can't do a whole lot of powerful analysis about it. The, 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 the section in the middle is what we consider data sufficient, which means that you know, it's not ready for real powerful deep learning type of AI, but still you can do some really solid analytics. And then to the right end of that spectrum is is you know stuff where there's there's a lot of data and you can you can really really uh, go nuts with the kind of analysis you can do. Um, the other set of questions to answer when it comes to uh, AI and big data for the sustainable development goals in, in particular is if you take if you take the idea of irrigation and fertilizer as we know food insecurity is a huge problem right um, and in sub-Saharan Africa barely five percent of smallholder farmers use irrigation and and, f and even fewer use fertilizer so um, so one really important problem that has to be solved is access to fertilizer and access to irrigation. Right? And so that vertical axis you see, um, it starts with direct intervention. So improving access to fertilizers and so on and so forth is what we would consider a direct intervention. The more ir irrigation there is, the more uh, agricultural yield there will be and the better the food security situation will be. And then you have what we consider secondary enablers or second order enables. So, so imagine now uh, if a farmer has access to microfinance. Farmer can use that microfinance to buy fertilizer or do something else, but uh, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't automatically uh, lead to yield improvements. It is a very strong enabler. And then we have what we consider tertiary enablers. So this is, now imagine if you had, if the farmer had uh, data uh, you know whether it's through 
AI or some other like a push mechanism or an app, uh, if the farmer had information on when to to um, uh, to apply the fertilizer and how much exactly and to what kind of crop, that would help. But obviously, they'd have to be able to uh, to have the uh, access to the fertilizer and be able to buy it. On the other axis is uh, dependence on AI and on big data. You know, some a lot of stuff can be done without a whole lot of data, or certainly not big data. Uh, the the second uh, thing there is the the, the second um, uh, threshold along the spectrum is yes there is data and you can do really good really good stuff with conventional analytics and what we mean by that is that this is not deep learning by any stretch this is stuff and algorithms and tools that have been around for the for the last couple of decades and and you know it's 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 uh, powerful enough and and proportional to the, the kind of data available. And then uh, at the right end of that spectrum is uh, a set of tools and set of interventions that really can leverage AI and big data. Now, um, what we've done is taken, you know, going back to uh, the study that Jenna mentioned earlier, the 50 breakthrough study. Now, our institute bases a lot of its work on this board, body of um, analysis we did a couple of years back called the 50 breakthroughs. What it does is methodically across all the aspects of the sustainable development goals. Uh, identify what the most important interventions are and and then puts the technology lens to it saying well is technology necessary for for um, implementing this intervention we do the same thing through a, a, an AI and, and a data lens and granted this is a, a very dense slide I'm not expecting to, you to to read the text but what I want you to see is the just the number of bullet points um, it, it is, so here we're looking explicitly at food security, health, um, energy access, and education. And uh, the the dimension I mentioned earlier, which is, you know, how many of these really important interventions uh, actually need any data? How many of them can benefit from conventional analytics? And how many of them need uh, big data and, and AI? And as you can see, those numbers, those number of bullet points start dwindling as you go from left to right which means that you can do a lot of really good stuff without a whole lot of data. You know, again, examples being things like clinics and, and, uh, and the clinicians and uh, fertilizer and irrigation and so on. And then there are some really valuable things you can do with, with solid analytics. So this is around credit scoring you know, for, for um, microfinance and so on. And then there are a small number of things that you can do with uh, AI and big data. Now, now, some of these are incredibly powerful, particularly things around um, uh, health diagnostics, but the numbers start shrinking as you go from left to right. So if you, if you map all of these bullet points um, on that two-dimensional matrix I, I uh, discussed earlier, what you see is that uh, most of the really powerful interventions actually don't, uh, they're, they're first of all, direct and 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 a smaller number of them are second order and and a, very, and a considerably smaller number are tertiary and similarly most of them uh, require um, you know I, either conventional analytics or no no real data at all and again as i said earlier there's a small number of very powerful things that can be done with ai so in summary as we are individually and collectively deciding uh, how much to bet on AI and, and where to place those bets, the most important thing we would suggest is let's make sure the foundational things are done well. People have to have access to medicines and to things like, uh, as I mentioned earlier, irrigation and, and clinics and teachers. Um, then there, is a, there are a lot of wins we can get uh, using conventional analytics without going too crazy on AI. Importantly, there will come a time, not necessarily in the next few years, but there will come a time when powerful data algorithms can, can really add a lot of value. And in anticipation of that and to prepare for that, it's very important to start building uh, underlying robust uh, data infrastructures. One example of that being India's Aadhaar system and, and, and India stack. The more that is replicated and the more the world catches up with a lot of the foundational interventions, the, the easier it will be for us to, to deploy um, big data and AI over time. Thank you. And over to you, Yana. Let me pass, pass the ball back. Thank you so much, Shashi. Um, all right. 
So with that, we're going to transition to Zia Khan. And for those of you who don't know him, he is the Vice President for Innovation, overseeing the Rockefeller Foundation's approach to developing solutions that can have transformative impact on people's lives, with a focus on innovative finance, data and technology, and science. He writes and speaks frequently on leadership, strategy, and innovation, as you will hear today. Mr. Khan has served on the World Economic Forum Advisory Council for Social Innovation and the U.S. National Advisory Board for Impact Investing. He's an investor and an advisor to a range of impact-oriented enterprises, and he'll share with us a little bit uh, regarding Rockefeller's perspective on data. So over to you, Zia. I see thank, that you're thank you, there Yana, you and, and thank you very much uh, to the Engineering for Change uh, group. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and share a few perspectives. And, and one of the joys of my job is I get to work with smart people like Shashi, who I think provided a really good analysis of AI uh, for development. Um, I just want to share a brief perspective on what all this means for development. I'm not um, an AI expert by any means, but we at the Rockefeller Foundation, who have been in the business of driving big social change in health and agriculture and employment opportunities for over 100 years, are incredibly excited about the developments that AI offers us to help have more impact uh, to more people around the world. Um, now, what I'm showing uh, on the screen right now is actually a graphic that I discovered in one of our annual reports from 1918. And it, what, the point I'm trying to make is that data was actually at the heart of how the foundation has operated uh, for over 100 years. I won't go into all the details, but basically this was an effort in Arkansas to eradicate malaria. And what the team would do is they, in a controlled way, would go into different communities, try different interventions, and measure the spread or the preponderance of malaria. And you can just sort of see visually, there's a little bit of a before and after fact that makes a pretty compelling case to identify what is it that's working. And once the foundation would find what worked, they would then quickly scale it up. Um, now, back in that day, uh, there was a lot of investment that had to make using a hypothesis-driven approach in collecting the data and gathering the data. Um, and frankly, not much changed over 100 years in how the development sector worked. Uh, typically, we would have a few hypotheses around what interventions could work. We'd spend some money to create the data collection approaches for that and assess what's working, what's not working, and try and scale those uh, things up. But with the advent of AI and big data, we can take a fundamentally different approach. And now we move on to this second chart. Um, and what is being shown here is a very fine scaled map somewhere in northern uh, Kenya. This is about a five kilometer by five kilometer view. And down at the pixel level, it gets to about 10 meters by 10 meters. That shows crop yields uh, for maize. So how much maize is a certain area producing and you can see the legend in the bottom corner, which is tons per hectare, where red is fairly high and blue is fairly low. Now, what's interesting about this chart is this is data that's actually readily available and is being converted and processed to understand what is happening on the ground. In this case, uh, there's a company that the Rockefeller Foundation helped start called Atlas AI that's based uh, and founded by some Stanford professors based on some research that they did, where what we're taking is uh, satellite imagery data and using some uh, um, other training data sets and machine learning algorithms, figuring out how to get really fine scale resolution on what is happening on the ground. And you can imagine this being useful for a range of folks. We have, uh, you know, we're in conversations with people at the World Bank who are very interested in understanding the net effect of their various interventions. There's the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa that's very interested in understanding how can fertilizers be used and other inputs uh, more productively. And then a lot of private companies that are interested in understanding this from a marketing and business development perspective as well. And uh, the point here, though, is that we no longer have to invest uh, in producing the data as much as we had to. We have all this data around us, and AI is able to help us use this big sea of data and reveal 
really important insights so that we can get better at predicting uh, what will have an effect. We can get better at understanding the cause and effect of different uh, um, interventions and really figure out which ones are the ones that are worth scaling up. Um, and we're just tremendously excited about the potential. As Shashi mentioned, there's a whole other conversation when it comes to the use of AI in terms of what effect it'll have on workers and what effect it'll have on jobs. That's an area that we're exploring as well. There's also a whole conversation around privacy and what rights do people have to their data and what, you know, how do we create data trust and data commons. Uh, but all this to share that from a development uh, perspective and from the business of driving social change, we're incredibly excited about the potential for AI and people like Shashi and others are helping us understand how we can use it appropriately and most effectively. Thank you so much for that overview, Zia. So you actually teed it up very nicely uh, for the conversation that we're going to have today jointly about some of these other nuances related to um, AI and data analytics. So what everyone should be seeing, attendees should be seeing on the screen right now is some questions that we're going to explore together with our panelists today. And if you have additional questions, I encourage you to enter them into the Q&A window so we'll, we'll tackle them towards the end. So um, as, as you mentioned, this is a, you know, a, a area that is riddled with a, you know, learning to be done. And one of the first questions that, that we are curious to explore is whether development players are really considering the right criteria generally before investing in AI or data analytics interventions. Shashi, obviously you shared some thoughts on, on how that should be thought about, frankly, and what the initial options are, but what has been your perspective uh, generally or what have you observed in the development sector? Are, are, is the right criteria being applied? No, one way to, one way to use data is to select uh, the right intervention um, out of a menu of interventions, right? Another way to use data is to do an ex post facto assessment of, of how an intervention has taken place, how well it is done. The third question is you know, whether data is the intervention in, unto itself, right? And, and as long as we are very clear how we're using data and not confusing one for the other, meaning that the fact that um, wh whether it's AI or just another uh, data-driven um, tool, uh, we should make sure that we're not confusing uh, an assessment tool for an intervention. Uh, and as long as we're clear about that uh, and, and, and about the role of data, I think we'll be okay. And right now, obviously, because, uh, you know, because it, is, it is a bright new shiny object, I suspect there, is, you know, uh, there are uh, a number of cases in which uh, there is overinvestment in data, but that will correct itself over time. So I'm not overly worried about it as long as as long as we can make sure we're using the right lens, the right filter, and not putting too much effort into into um, into into data, assuming that it will not naturally lead to the more foundational investments. And and Thea, in your experience, I guess this also can apply to um, impact ventures. Um, are they uh, kind of jumping on the shiny new uh, tech? bandwagon or do, you, do, do they think about the right parameters before pursuing an AI or data analytics uh, strategy? Uh, it, it's a great question. And I think I would, uh, I would say there's, there's two questions that you need to consider, I think, in the space. What can you do with data and AI, which tends to be a technical question, and what should you do with data and AI? which is not a technical question, but people uh, conflate it um, as well. And we're seeing all sorts of evidence with that with the various social media platforms as well. You know, one of the challenges in the space is um, the, the unintended consequences are, are still something we don't fully understand. And yeah. we at the foundation are, um, uh, we're trying to figure out what is the right middle balance. O on the one hand, we don't want uh, people to get too conservative about the potential consequences because we still have a lot of poverty in the world. We're still facing climate change and we need to move with some urgency on all these. And we think there's enormous potential. On the other hand, we want to be conscious of what are these issues. 
And so for us, the, the, the right approach is really to try and integrate different perspectives together. How do we make sure that technologists are having the right conversations with civil society, that they're having the right conversations with government, and that we can come up with some guiding principles or frameworks around how to use technologies like AI data and also blockchain. Data is particularly interesting because of the privacy questions and different countries are taking different approaches. Uh, China has an approach where the government has a lot of access to data. In the US, we take one where the private sector has a lot of access and India is trying to develop an approach where the user has a lot of access. There's always gonna be a tension between what is good for the individual and what do they have the rights to and what is good for the public and society. And I think public health is a classic example where the more data we have, the more we can do around public health, but medical data and health data is a very personal and private thing. So I don't have any answers to this. I think we're starting to understand where the tensions are and a role that the foundation hopefully can play uh, and other actors is how do we create the right bridges and conversations to come up with guidelines around this. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really um, interesting. And you, you kind of uh, bridged the, the other question that we were planning to explore around data privacy standards and practices. Um, so, Shashi, do you want to build on that and, you know, given some of these regional uh, approaches to privacy, um, is there anything, uh, any guidelines that you want to uh, share or, you know, have the audience consider as they're maybe exploring this for their own projects? Yeah, you know, Zia hit the nail on the head when he said it's important to distinguish between what can be done and what should be done. Um, what should be done, and then and then there's another um, corollary question to that, which is how sh how should it be done, right? And you know that is still emerging. To be told, even even the most, you know, I live in California, and and even the most sort of data savvy part of the world, so to speak, is still struggling uh, with with questions about privacy and and standards. Um, you know, I'm again, I don't consider myself a a, a, a privacy protocol expert, but clearly, you know, uh, that balance between between an individual's privacy versus uh, kind of metadata about the individual that that can and should be used for the for the general good, you know, that that's something that um, currently uh, you know people working on data solutions have to wrestle with. And the challenge is they're wrestling, they're, they're, they're being forced to wrestle with that question in the absence of a robust policy framework. Now, the, the thing with data is once it's, uh, particularly private data, is once it's out there, it's out there. It's very, very hard to take it back. So there's a real urgency around, um, around uh, making sure that the right uh, protection mechanisms and the right policy frameworks are in place. My worry is uh, things aren't moving fast enough but then just going back to that question you asked, uh, the, I guess the next question, which is, uh, you know, is, is, um, is it worth it, right? Is, is, are the risks um, uh, of the widely de deployed data acquisition platforms, uh, do they outweigh the benefits? I don't think so. You know, with any technology, any generation of technology, there is no, there's no free lunch. So my sense is that uh, data will start adding more and more value. I mean, right now, as I mentioned earlier, there are limits to what can be done in countries that we consider data efficient, data deficient. But uh, you know, even if we put the perfect protocols in place, they, people who want to exploit data for for you know, less than um, savory purposes will continue to do so. So this challenge isn't going away anytime soon. Uh, but overall, my sense is that. You know, like like with any other technology advance, uh, it's a double-edged sword. Of course. Do you do you have any recommendations around resources or case studies or some examples that uh, really highlight uh, good practices uh, in terms of data privacy um, by by key players that you might be able to point the audience to or we can follow up with? Well, you know, there are a couple of um, uh, examples that, that we can build on. So if you think about um, health data, you know, in the U.S., um, there was a lot of concern about about individual health data being exploited by, you know, by insurance companies for denying insurance and things of that sort. And so uh, a few years back, I guess uh, quite a few years back, um, uh, the, the HIPAA uh, po uh, policy framework was put in place. 
it's essentially uh, uh, you know a framework for protecting individual health even though so the broader health trends and so on can be used for for important um, uh, decisions now what we're seeing is in our health work in 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 Kenya for instance right uh, where there isn't necessarily a fully evolved set of um, uh, data protection standards it turns out that something like HIPAA is actually uh, is being considered a gold standard now similar uh, similar standards are there for protections about uh, on, on financial data and so on but what you don't see is you know, uh, uh, stuff that people post themselves you know so if you if you if you put data out there um, voluntarily it, there really isn't anything to to protect uh, against that yet the more troubling thing is you know stuff that companies collect with your implicit consent you know the, the stuff that you know you, you you're signing off on the dotted line uh, uh, allowing them permission to collect this data um, but you're not actually aware that uh, about the extent and, and the volume of data that's being collected uh, about you for that unfortunately there isn't any example yet and, and, and I actually would just, one of our – oh, sorry, go ahead, Yeah, Sorry, apologies. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add a couple of uh, points. Um, I think there are probably some good examples around policies. Um, I think what's important is for there to be frameworks of the right questions to ask yourself in your situation. So, for example, we worked with the Beck Center at Georgetown University to produce an ethical framework for the use of blockchain, which doesn't necessarily give answers, but it almost gives a decision tree of these are the questions you should be asking yourself. And the second point I'll make is privacy itself is a pretty fuzzy concept. It, it doesn't have a specific definition, and it, it's very culturally shaped. Um, so, for example, uh, if you look through the history of the United States, you know, we don't have a general concern around a police officer walking around and writing down license plate numbers on a notepad near a scene of a crime, but we are bothered by the idea of a CCT, you know, V camera capturing license plates of everyone going down a right. street. Um, so we find that in conversations with folks, the idea of identifying what specific threats are you worried about and how do you respond to those threats is probably a more productive way to have a conversation about privacy than just privacy as some general abstract concept. Right, it's a very good point. Uh, one of our listeners actually actually kind of contributed to these examples uh, that should be thought about. So uh, he noted that he or she actually, I can't tell for the name, so apologies. Uh, the listener uh, noted that people use Google to research symptoms about their health, for example, which is data that can be used towards diagnostics apps on smartphones that, uh, that use the phones uh, capably to gather their pulse, blood pressure, et cetera. So um, she noted, thank you for clarifying, she noted that privacy can be opt-in and opt-out. So that's a very good point and I think contributes to, you know, to your conversation uh, here. So we've been, we've been hearing a lot about how the risk of bias is a big concern in development and applications of AI. What steps are being taken to prevent further marginalization of the underserved. And whoever wants to jump in to talk about this first is welcome. See so, yeah, after you, my friend. Yeah, sure. Well, I'll make a couple <laughs> of quick points. Thank, thank you. Very, very generous of you, Shachi. Um, uh, I think bias can uh, happen in a few ways. You know, one is in terms of, uh, and I think you framed it well, like there's the application. And one big effort of ours is just how do we make sure that social sector organizations get access to the modern techniques and approaches that can really help them out? Uh, because data scientists are, um, you know, it's a hot commodity these days. And it's hard both because of the nature of the work, but also, frankly, because of the labor market uh, for a lot of these uh, social sector organizations to get access um, to them. So we're trying to do a couple of things. One is uh, we have... Uh, invested in a group called DataKind, which is an amazing group. They're sort of like a Doctors Without Borders for data scientists, where they take data scientists working in different companies and try and connect them to social sector problems. Uh, so, for example, a, a data scientist at Netflix who focuses on demand prediction can get connected to a water utility that's struggling to manage for demand, to do some work, and all of a sudden that water utility is saving $25 million a year. So we're trying to encourage and figure out how we get the application more broad-fed. 
the development is a really important point there. And there's all sorts of things that are coming out, particularly when you look at the justice system at how, when based on the data sets, but also frankly, the cultural mindsets and approaches of the developers are coming from a more homogenous community that's anchored in Silicon Valley, what are the unintended consequences? We don't have any good solutions to that right now. We're trying to encourage diversity in scientists around AI and trying to encourage and support their work um, and highlight these issues, but we don't have any good answers right now. Yeah, um, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a great summary, Zia. Um, you know, this is my biggest, one of my biggest worries about the blind use of data. So if, if you take the, the simple example of people using mobile money, right, uh, you know, M-Pesa in Kenya, for instance. Um, obviously, in Kenya, M-Pesa has made, made um, yeah, you know, has achieved tremendous penetration. But imagine if you turn the clock back a few years, and if you were to use some, some of that early data generated by, by M-Pesa users, and try to extrapolate to the broader population on the basis of that. Obviously, you know, you would only get a very biased sample. And, and you know, the, that's, um, that's going to be a problem uh, in data deficient countries where it is quite likely that the, the initial rounds of data will, will not be all in, uh, inclusive and it even won't be representative of, of the broader population. So there'll be significant limits on the kind of uh, things you can do to extrapolate from a limited sample um, of data points and making broad generalizations and, and policy decisions on the basis of that can be quite troubling. And, and this is where data, you know, the concept of data science is extraordinarily important. You have to know uh, how representative uh, you know, a, a set of data points is about the broader population. Truth be told, the, the mathematics of this is actually there. The only question is, will the people using data, both for analytics and then broader extrapolation and, and, and policy making, will they use those uh, common sense mathematical tools that have been, that have been around forever? That's a golden question right there. Uh, interestingly, um, so we have plenty of questions at the end, but I, I think this one is quite aligned to the discussion, so I'm going to uh, go ahead and, and introduce it now. So would something like blockchain or the quantum internet do away with the bias and the business of sites like DataKind or organizations like DataKind? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I can't <laughs> say I fully understand the question because I'm, uh, I'm not sure I understand the comparison. Um, uh, but maybe I'll, I'll offer a comment in case it's relevant uh, to the question if it's not an answer. Um, I think one thing we um, uh, shouldn't fall into the trap of thinking is that uh, everything can get automated. Um, we are complex people. We're working for the impact of people. And so something as straightforward, or something that sounds as straightforward as going into an organization understanding their data science needs is actually a pretty complex social process. You know, what is the problem? How are they going to solve it? It could be threatening to some people who um, are invested in doing it a different way. It could upend the power dynamics of the organization. So the idea of introducing data science, just like the idea of introducing any kind of capability into an organization is not sort of an automatic process. So I, I have a low confidence that there will be some technology that emerges in the next five, 10 years that actually replaces that. And that way, I, I really do think there's always going to be a human interface in shaping the problems and understanding and determining what it is that we need to go forward on. That is actually the essence of what DataKind does. They invest a lot of time to figure out what is happening in organizations. And the way it's been described to me is, which I like this metaphor, is it's like thinking you're going to bake a cake and then just walking into the kitchen and finding out you don't have flour, you don't have any eggs, but you do have a few other ingredients. And as you rummage through the kitchen, you do come up with new options of what it is that you can make. It's very hard for me to think about how you automate that process. So if that is what the question is getting at, then, then I'm, I'm not so optimistic. What I am optimistic, though, about is how do we use network technologies to improve that matching between supply and demand? Once we have shaped the demand for various organizations and once we expand the network of volunteers who want to connect and offer their help and are motivated by having social impact, there I do think there are some technologies that could help us. 
Shashi, do you have any perspective? Question. Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, um, relevant to the last uh, bullet point on, on on the page you have with questions, um, you, you know, it's uh, if you any any um, any policy school before they before you graduate with a degree in policy, you know, you study statistics, and the reason you study statistics is that it's it's a it's a very important toolkit to uh, for you to use to understand how much you can you can extrapolate from data for making big policy decisions and nowadays lots of people are both subject to decisions about them make, being uh, made with uh, with data and, and an increasing number of people are using tools um, black box tools to make decisions using data right and so what that means is it will be extraordinarily important for for a much broader swath of the population to become data literate, and what that means everything from understanding you know um, how to how to protect uh, your own uh, data parameters and at the other end of the spectrum is to you know how to use data and how much to rely on on whatever data you're you're using to make your decisions and. Uh, you know, to, to Zia's point, there's not going to be any magical tool that will help you um, automatically uh, ring fence you know, good data versus bad data. But it's very important for the broader society and individuals to become data literate so that you know, we are much smarter about about this, this very powerful um, toolkit that we're starting to use. I heartily agree with that particular point. Um, I think we're all still kind of capturing up on that front. So with that in mind, that perspective of what, you know, is necessary to, to really leverage these powerful tools, for those who are interested in entering this field for the purpose of solving some of these intractable problems, how would you recommend they get involved, uh, you know, beyond, let's say, educating themselves and becoming more data literate generally? What else, uh, should, how else should they equip themselves to be effective? Ashashi, I, can, I, I think yeah, you like yeah. that. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, I can. I can go first. So you know the, the, you know, there's this phrase "hammer looking for a nail," right? So for those of us in mm -hmm. the technology for good space, whether it's data or whether it's it's any technology, it's much much more important to understand the the underlying problem we we wish to solve um, than it is to be a deep expert in any particular uh, technical field, whether it's data or otherwise. The worry with uh, Approaching this from a pure data expertise lens is that you know, everything looks like a data problem, right? And and so without uh, without investing a lot in understanding the underlying problem, if we try to force fit um, any solution, whether it's whether it's data or or anything else, I am afraid that we'll be guilty of hammers looking for nails. Yeah, I I couldn't agree with that any uh, uh, more. There is. And it's well intentioned, but there's a whole yeah. uh, range of efforts, largely by uh, technology companies, to showcase their technology and show how it can have positive impact. And I think uh, Shashi's entire presentation was around, you know, sometimes we might have overkill, and you need to get the right tool for the right nail um, uh, or the right problem at hand. So um, I, I think the the interesting space for us on how I think people can get involved is how do you create that bridge between the supply of interesting data and data analytics and the demand from the sector. And so I think the right interface is, you know, asking questions of, you know, to solve this problem, is there a prediction problem? If we could predict some things better, would that be really meaningful and important? Or if we understood the cause and effect, is that sort of the question that we're struggling with? Or are we better able to compare effects uh, or different interventions? I think if you can think of those bridging questions, then people from the field who want to use data science can translate their field expertise and knowledge into those questions. And then data scientists can understand what are the most applicable, uh, most applicable tools and techniques for those different kinds of questions. But there needs to be some kind of space for those two to get come together. Uh, and too often in the development sector, I think there's a lot of people who are hearing a lot about AI and they just kind of want to walk into the AI store and find themselves <laughs> some shiny AI and apply it to a problem. And, and the reality is it's going to take a joint effort, a team effort, an integrated effort to make the best out of the data uh, supply and data technique supply and the demand of the very real problems we're all struggling to address. 
Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm I curious about that because, you know, you talk about the spaces and there's some forums that, for example, come to mind to me where those kinds of conversation can happen. Like here in New York City, there's the Bloomberg Data for Good Exchange, which often is a forum for that kind of um, interface. Do you have any recommendations or uh, kind of your go-tos for these kinds of forums where these questions are explored and, you know, there's an opportunity to learn? and not, you know, be uh, pigeonholed into the AI store mindset? Uh, either one of you. Yeah. Sure, well, well, I'll just share that I think, I think there is um, a, a meeting of the middle that is starting to happen. So I think m more and more of the tech conferences are including social sector actors early to frame and shape the conversations around what are the most important applications versus what are the most interesting applications. And and so I think just, uh, and, and again, I don't know the entire space, but you have uh, conferences like Code for America or others who are much more conscious of those efforts. And then similarly, I think a lot of the development conferences that happen are no longer trying to treat it like a science fair in terms of showcasing the technology, but applying some of their internal uh, techniques. So I don't really have an answer other than optimism that this is happening. And we ourselves mm -hmm. are trying to invest in, you know, we're calling them charrettes, but kind of like how do we take a new approach to meetings where people can come with various assets and spend real time together uh, to develop meaningful solutions, or at least catalyze a new sort of problem framing or new use cases. And uh, the, the and the use cases is actually a term we're starting to use more and more because we think that is the way to think of how to integrate both the demand that is relevant to users, uh, but also the supply of solutions. Right. And Shashi, I know that ITT has authored white papers uh, or briefs on this topic. Are, are there other recommendations that you have for forums or opportunities for, for these kinds of conversations to, to really explore these questions? Uh, in more depth with other organizations that are also applying these techniques? No, um, no recommendations per se, but just an observation. Uh, you know, we are on the cusp of something, a really interesting decade. Um, you know, whereas if you think about hardware solutions, there aren't that many organizations that can very easily jump in and introduce very powerful hardware solutions, right? But with software, with data, you know, it's led to a real democratization of the solution space. Anyone uh, with, with some, some you know, basic understanding of, of coding and access to data can, can start doing very powerful things. So part of me is actually quite excited about, about this democratization so that we'll, we'll start seeing a much uh, broader set of solutions being offered uh, to solve the big problems we care about. So I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> That's a, great to hear the optimism there. So I do want to address one question that came from our audience uh, regarding uh, the plans for using AI to assess the ramifications of, uh, I guess in this case, impact interventions. For example, uh, they know that the agricultural intervention of providing fertilizer may and often does lower water quality or cause uh, eutrophication and so forth. So. Any examples or uh, something you want to share regarding um, the application of AI to understand some potentially unintended consequences, as you mentioned, Zia? Sure, I'll um, I'll share a brief perspective on that. So uh, it turns out that that was a big consequence of the Green Revolution, which was a big effort uh, through the 1950s and 60s. <laughs> Uh, where a much more scientific approach to agriculture was taken in Latin America and Asia. And on the positive side, it is largely credited with having saved a billion lives uh, and saving entire countries like India and Pakistan from mass starvation. Uh, there were some unintended consequences to that, uh, ranging from concentrating the financial gains to larger landholders and leaving smallholder farmers out of it and some environmental consequences. So um, I mentioned that not as uh, an excuse for how we go forward on AI, but just to say there are unintended consequences. I am optimistic though that AI and big data will allow people to simulate and assess a wider range of consequences than they were able to in the past. 
So while I certainly do not believe that the nature of these problems just by definition means there are unpredictable consequences and such, I am, I'm pretty optimistic that we'll get a better handle on what are the scenarios that can play out because we can just do much faster analysis using a much wider range of data points than would have been possible before. You know, one particular example I'm, I'm very excited about, it's an organization that, that Zia works quite closely with. It's called Planet, and I don't remember if Zia mentioned it earlier today, but um, it is, you know, in my opinion, one of the more remarkable uh, companies out there today. They figured out a way to get you know, tiny satellites um, up in the sky, right? And they've they've now deployed the largest fleet of satellites in history. And they uh, so Planet takes a, 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 an image, reasonable resolution image of every point on the planet, on, on Earth, every day. And so um, that's an enormous amount of data that can tell a lot about whether it, whether it's whether it's pollution, whether it's um, deforestation, you know, I was at an event hosted by Human Rights Watch, uh, the NGO, um, a couple of days back, and they were able to document, you know, with, with, with tremendous detail, um, the atrocities that were being perpetrated um, on the Rohingya population in, in Burma. Um, and, uh, uh, and so, you know, so, so that, um, that one tool in particular, and I'm not sure what their where the policy is around making their data available. But uh, you know, when it comes to specific things that are happening and observable on the surface of the planet, I actually think that um, you know these satellite images can be incredibly powerful. And so, for those of you who want to start looking at stuff in your area, so let's let's say you're working you know in in country X where currently nobody else is doing anything. Uh, I suspect that you can use planet satellite imagery to to start um, doing analysis of your own, whether it, whether whether it's to track pollution, whether it's to track you know, uh, development and and construction of roads and so on and so forth. That's that's a really great actual uh, piggyback because one of our listeners wanted to know how to make a data poor country a data rich country, how to move them on that index that you shared earlier, Shashi. Um, he notes that, or again, she, I have got to stop using pronouns, uh, that time and resources uh, that are needed for that may not be available. So uh, leveraging, you know, these kinds of organizations like Planet, uh, Planet Satellite Data, if it is available, assuming that it is, may be one option. Are there other pathways? Yeah, you know, so um, my my own sense of, of that that um, journey between data deficient and data rich, a lot of that stuff has to come from the government. And partly because uh, the, the the data will increasingly become a public good, but also some of these things are foundational and and just too expensive for for uh, any individual company to do. Um, so so the foundational stuff has to be, I think, uh, government led. On top of that. You can have uh, private companies do stuff, whether whether it's um, you know whether it's the M-Pesa mobile money smartphone stuff, or or otherwise. And then the third layer is is citizen data, and obviously you need a, you need some sort of a platform for for uh, citizen data to to be added. But uh, you know again, if you, if you go to if you go to the the planet stuff, for instance, I, I can imagine uh, someone doing some really interesting analysis using uh, the planet imagery and posting that data in a public forum, uh, making it available to everybody. Um, the only challenge there, of course, is the moment you start having uh, citizen data scientists who are collecting data and posting it out there, is we have to be very careful about selection bias and, and so on and so forth. But, uh, but currently, my sense is there's enough, there are enough platforms out there for, for citizens to start getting involved and start creating their own public data platforms. Right. So interestingly, a question also came in that bridges that is, uh, or builds on that, or what global data sets are available to social entrepreneurs to use to apply AI um, to develop solutions to global problems that they are addressing? Beyond Planet, do you have any other examples? Um, I can go and Zia, uh, you, you can jump in. Again, I would rephrase that question, right, which is 
what's the problem you want to solve? I mean, the poverty is mm-hmm. a pretty broad problem, right? And, and social problems, um, it's a pretty broad category. My sense is, my, 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 my advice would be rather than, rather than phrase the question in terms of how can I use data and AI, work back, you know, work forwards from the problem you're trying to solve and then understand the applicability of, of you know, data-driven, AI-driven uh, tools and then figure out what data you need to, uh, to build out those tools. You know, what it highlights for me, though, is because uh, I'm drawing a bit of a blank on the answer to the question. I think, Shashi, you are framing it in the correct way. But it seems to me something that would be useful is some kind of central directory of all the different data sets that are available. So if people did have kind of a sense of um, what problem they are trying to solve, they had a, mm-hmm. a place to go to. Uh, and that's a very helpful um, uh, uh, I love that question because it sparks some ideas for me around what we might be able to do to be helpful in that. Likewise, Zia, yeah, actually, it's a very exciting one for us as well. I've come across various data sets. Many of them are sector specific, as they should be, and region specific, again, as they should be. And this may be an opportunity for us to work even jointly to uh, build at least a starting point uh, kind of guide for some that are already available and freely uh Fully open for for folks to use. So we have reached time, and I I really I apologize for those of you whose questions we may have not addressed. But I do want to uh, thank our Shashi and Zia for their time. I know both of you are incredibly busy with a lot of travel, and we we're really grateful for you setting aside this hour to explore these questions with us. Uh, they're really critical questions, and these conversations. There are not that many forums where they can be had, so it's great that we can use this platform. So with that, I'd like to thank all of our attendees as well for, atten- uh, for joining us today. For those of you who are interested in your professional development hours, do uh, use the link that's provided on the slide or go to your member dashboard to uh, actually fill out the form to get those PDHs. If you have questions that we didn't address and would like us to direct them towards the speakers, feel free to email us at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. And for those of you who are still looking at the chat, uh, one of our listeners was kind enough to share uh, a link to some data from the World Bank, so feel free to pull that. And last but not least, uh, um, please do become an E4C member to get more information on upcoming webinars and resources that we're pulling together for you. So with that, I wish you all a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next E4C webinar. As you can see, my own technology failed me. My earbuds uh, went out during the middle of this call. So just a reminder that technology doesn't solve everything, but it can be really useful to addressing some of our critical problems. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.